Hey, thanks for stopping by. My name's Thomas, and this is Zarbo Audio Projects. And today we're going to take a peek at this interesting racetrack style buyout speaker sold by Parts Express. Parts Express will occasionally get unique speakers like this in stock, and they'll sell them for a very reasonable price. This one comes in at just under $2 each, and they have over 4,000 of them in stock at the time of this video. According to the write up, this speaker was used in flat panel televisions. I'll put a link down below where you can buy them. In one of my previous videos, I demoed this Bluetooth amplifier that I was considering for a small radio project, and I've been in search of a speaker driver to use for that same project. And when I saw this speaker for sale online, and after having read a few reviews that suggested that it did a decent job with music, I took a gamble and I picked up a few of them to try out. And speaking of picking them up, by the way, I just want you to know that everything that I review on my channel is purchased with my own money, unless otherwise stated. Well, here are the dimensions. As far as width, it's about 5 and 5 sixteenths of an inch wide at the top, and 6 and 1 sixteenths of an inch wide at the bottom. It has kind of a trapezoid shape to it. It's about 5 and 1 sixteenths of an inch deep, and toward the rear, before that last angle as it gets very small at the back, it's four and one quarter of an inch wide. It's also one and a quarter of an inch deep. Well, you may have noticed already that this is not your normal small speaker driver. It has a trick or two up its sleeve. It's actually two speakers in one. It has two separate voice coils driving one cone. The idea of having two voice coils on one driver isn't exactly new. Subwoofers have used this configuration for years. I believe it started back when subwoofers used to be passively powered. Here's a good example of that. These are pics of a popular Radio Shack subwoofer from the 1990s. They had two voice coils as opposed to just one, so they could connect to the left and right side of a standard household stereo amplifier. The built-in passive crossover split the signal at usually around 120 Hz or so, and it sent the bass to the subdriver, and the rest of the signal it sent to the main speakers. And that's how you were able to use one subwoofer with your main stereo speakers 30 years ago. These days, we often do sub-bass with a single voice coil driver and subwoofer plate amplifier. But back then, dual voice coil passive subwoofers was really a thing. But how does one driver reproduce both sides of a stereo signal, you might ask? Well, bass is almost always mixed to mono in most recordings by the recording engineers. In other words, whatever bass exists in the right side is also in the left side. So, as far as subwoofers are concerned, stereo really isn't a thing. And I wonder if that wasn't done, at least in part, to make life easier for the recording engineers on vinyl records to make the stylus movements more linear. But I'm guessing there. I'll let the guy from Technology Connections handle that one. This is not a subwoofer, however. And the two voice coils are on two separate cylinders, separated by several inches. Now, why would you want to design a speaker this way? Well, I know this seems unlikely, but it could possibly be to create a very small two-channel stereo speaker within one enclosure to keep size and costs down, possibly in a small LCD TV. The treble and mid-range frequencies could vibrate individually from each other a little bit, and where the lower frequencies with their larger cone movements would be handled by both concurrently. This arrangement would be far from optimum, but I wouldn't put it past a manufacturer to try to save a buck by doing this. And after listening to the speaker set up this way for a bit with the two voice coils set up for left and right stereo, I can at least confirm that it's listenable. Another more plausible reason is just to give manufacturers some wiring options, as the two 6 ohm voice coils on this driver would present either a 3 or 12 ohm load, depending on if it's hooked up in parallel or in series. Well, we don't know why exactly these were manufactured this way. But what I want to know is if they have decent frequency response. If I'm going to use these in a radio, they've got to sound decent, or they're not worth using in my opinion. I'm thinking that the goal of a television is to have clear and audible vocals, because that's what the majority of TV is about, the spoken word. If you're watching a movie and you want lots of bass and loud volume, you're likely going to turn on your surround sound stereo. But TV, well, that's pretty much about clarity and hearing the spoken word well. So I'm thinking this may have a little boost in the middle frequencies, and if I'm going to use this for a Bluetooth radio build, it has to have somewhat flat frequency response, so I need to know what I'm dealing with here. Well first, let's put it on the DATS, or the Dayton Audio Test System, and we'll double check the tuning and the specs for the ohms 
on the two voice coils. And then we'll run some sweeps on it with the Dayton Audio Omni Mic to see how well this oddball driver performs. We can see from the sweep that I did that the published tuning of the enclosure at 140 hertz is pretty much right on. For this test, I connected the positives and negatives of the two voice coils together. And this is called parallel wiring. And it basically adds the two 6 ohm coils together and divides by two, leaving us with around three ohms. You can also connect this in series. And to do that, you're going to connect the, the negative line from the amplifier to the negative lead of one of the coils. Then you're going to connect the positive test lead from the amplifier to the positive lead of the other coil. And the two leads that are left over, you just connect together. The tuning stays the same, but it now presents a 12 ohm load to the amplifier, as you can see. I should also note that if this were a subwoofer, it would be fine just to connect one coil of the driver. But since the two coils are not wound on the same cylinder, you wouldn't want to run this with just one coil connected, because it would basically be rocking the whole time it would be playing. And when I say rocking, I don't mean in a good way. I really doubt that this rocking motion is going to sound very good at all. In order to get semi-accurate response curves, I've arranged the speaker in a similar way to what I envisioned this project looking like when finished. If I do end up using this driver, I plan to use one per side for stereo in a tall orientation format. So I place these plastic enclosures on an angle as I would if they were in the actual enclosure with the help of some foam poster board and some black electrical tape. How the drivers are mounted will affect the overall sound, so it's a good idea to measure any speaker in the cabinet that they will reside for the finished project. We'll do a near field sweep at about a foot or so away from the cone and we'll see what we come up with. I've got the OmniMic software up and running. Microphone's about a foot away from the speaker and I'm, I've got track 2, a mono short sign sweep queued up on the phone which I'm sending Bluetooth to the amplifier connected to the speaker. And Here we go. Well, we can see here that we've got a little hump between uh, 2 and 500 hertz, maybe a little baffle step compensation, you could call it. And it comes down a little bit uh, down to a lull just uh, before 1K. And these are 5 decibel horizontal scales there. So a little dip there at, at uh, 900 hertz or so, and then a little rise at about 1200. And then we got another Another rise there, another peak at about 6,000 hertz or so. But, I mean, that's not flat, but just for a raw speaker of uh, of the stature that this is, a $2 buyout speaker, eh, it's not really bad, I don't think. And then it drops off pretty sharp after, what is that, six, seven, 7,000 hertz or so. It kind of drops off after that like a cliff, but eh, I don't think that's awful considering the price. Well, since I already had the OmniMic out, I figured just for fun, let's see what the port's doing. How's that contributing to the overall frequency response? And as you can see, from about 70 hertz to maybe 120 hertz or so, it does add a little bit to the output. Well, the purpose of this video was to determine if this unique speaker driver would be able to reproduce music at a decent quality. Measurements are great and all, and they can help point out flaws, but in order to really know if a particular driver is going to work for your intended application, you should listen to some music through it. So let's do that. Yes, I know. It's hard to get a good idea of what a speaker is really doing through the internet with all the microphones and the processing and the compression and stuff. But it is a speaker video after all, so I at least need to make the effort. 
but I think it's pretty clear that this driver will be fine for a small Bluetooth radio. And after listening to it for a while, the only real complaint I have with it is the drop off on the high end. But adding a tweeter and a crossover would just blow the budget on this project for very minimal gains. So I think I'll stick with this driver just the way that it is. Well that about wraps up this program, but I invite you to stay tuned for a future video where I plan to create a small stereo Bluetooth radio, actually three of them, using this driver. I'm going to go about the construction a bit differently than I normally do with this project though. It's going to be a build-off of sorts. I'm going to make one with all my big power tools versus making one with just a few small tools. Should be pretty interesting and a lot of fun. Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.